Uh, so good morning and welcome to the webinar titled Sharing Promising Practices to Support Frontline Workers in Smaller Centers. My name is Sarah Sehek. I'm AMSA's Engagement Coordinator and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Before we begin, uh, we would like to go through some housekeeping. First off, we would like to acknowledge that this webinar is funded by Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. Also, as a provincial umbrella association, AMSA acknowledges that BC is on the unceded homelands of the First Nations who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We recognize the privilege that we have as settlers on this land and acknowledge that AMSA's operations is on the ceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. So in terms of an agenda, uh, in today's webinar, we will have two smaller center service providers, one from BC, and Ram from Manitoba, who will share promising practices in engaging effective collaboration. Service providers will have an opportunity to learn tools on engaging in collaboration from first-hand experiences of other smaller center service providers. After the two presentations, we will end with a question and answer period. So I would like to introduce um, our first presenter, Jane Drew. Uh, Jane Drew works in Fort St. John, which is a rural community in Northern British Columbia uh, that is rapidly growing in cultural diversity. The focus on the regional issues uh, of diversity are supported within the School District 60 Settlement Program Framework to assist newcomers, immigrant families settle and thrive in the community. At the district level, Jane regularly collaborates with internal stakeholders. When families go to neighborhood schools, protocols have been put in place so parents, students, and staff have the opportunity to access educational assistance. In an effort to be visible at schools and to build a relationship with school staff, Jane continues to create and implement programs such as multicultural books in schools that promote interactive discussions regarding diversity and inclusions. So welcome, Jane. I will let you uh, further introduce yourself uh, and take over. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, thank you everybody for joining us today. I would like to acknowledge that I am coming to you from Fort St. John, British Columbia in the North Peace region, the territory of the, the Dene Zaw Treaty 8. So um, I appreciate everyone coming today and would like to share a little bit about our organization. Um, if we can just, yeah, maybe get to our first slide. My, my presentation today is on collaboration versus competition. And basically, living in the north, living in a rural remote community, kind of for, uh, compete. So what we've done, we've been, um, we have, Swiss has been in the community for approximately 14 years. We started in 2007 when Swiss was uh, run by the provincial government, the BC provincial government. It was a pilot program and we had a coordinator at the time who really saw the need for some assistance with newcomers. You know, we could really see we're, we're um, the industry that we're in is natural gas industry. It's a big industry in the area. And we really recognize the need for um, some, some help with the newcomers. Once doing that, we thought, okay, wait a minute, we really need to incorporate everybody in the community, all of the service providers in the community. So we at Swiss in the school district 60 had reached out to some of our connections in the community, um, employment connections, literacy society, success, city of Fort St. John. So we kind of formed this informal group that we called the Community Multicultural Immigrant Services, CMIS. It was just easier to um, to call it CMIS. What we did was we took School District 60, Employment Connections, Literacy and Success. Four of us got together and said, listen, we all kind of provide these services to newcomers in the community. Newcomers in the community was new to us. So it was, what is the best thing that we can do for our families, for the groups in the community, um, to get the services across to who we need to get them to. We are, we're a small town. 
we don't have multicultural centers. We don't have a YMCA. We don't have a YWCA. We don't have um, places, drop in places for different groups to go. So we were forced to create them. So we became a really strong core collaboration. We partnered, we became friends. So once we started sharing calendar, we shared calendars, we said, who's doing, who's doing what this week? Who's doing what next month? Then we quickly realized there are a lot more people in our community that deal with newcomer immigrant families. So then we started reaching out to more, more groups. We first, first thing we did, we went to the city of Fort St. John, we went to the recreation director and said, hey, look, we, we, you have services, we have families, why don't we start getting them together? Same as the Fort St. John Public Library. So many public libraries are overlooked and they, their programs are amazing. We reached out to the children's librarian and she's like, yes, I know all of these families. I work with them, let's do something formally. Urban Systems, that's an engineering company in town and they have a sub committee that's called urban matters and what they want to do is really focus on the 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 newcomers in the community how can we reach out to them women's resource society salvation army association for community living neat the northern environment Act, uh, environmental action team so many of these organizations do the same thing so instead of competing for different funding why don't we all just bring our little bit of funding and make one great big thing so we started monthly meetings. It sounds a lot like a lip. It is. This was before we had lip. So it sounds a lot like lip because it is lip. So this is why I want to get into talking about collaboration versus competition and what the pros and cons are, right? So collaboration, it's got a lot more positive effects on productivity individual group social just a real sense of responsibility to the other group members right so when you're collaborating then you have a bit of responsibility to everybody in the group be that if it's in your own if it's within school district 60 if it's within the community if it's within a core group you do share this sense of responsibility it really does encourage people to give their best because you don't want to let the other team members down right so what you do what we have done and this is all based on past experience that that we've had at school district 60 60 with swiss is we really encourage the entire team to put everyone's talents to the best use so say i have a clerical person that's wonderful with excel spreadsheet i'm not going to try to do that because i i'm not really good at that right so if you can really identify people's strengths and put them to the best use that's when collaboration starts to become really, really cool. So one of the really biggest pros to collaboration is the culture that it creates. So a huge advantage is the efforts of the workplace culture. It's kind of the way the work is divided. So like I was just talking about, I have a clerical person who's really good at Excel. I have a Swiss worker who is fantastic at relationship building. That's how we're going to divide up the work. So when more than one person in the organization is involved in a certain task or a large project, it helps to, for everyone to have a little bit of a small portion of the responsibilities. It just really makes sure that things get done versus overloading it all onto one person with too much. Right. So that's one of the huge pros of a collaboration is the culture that it creates. Informal collaborations. That's what I was talking about at the beginning. We started an informal collaboration, which when I say informal, it's kind of versus the lip versus IRCC funding. It's groups that come together. This is an example of what we did, but groups that come together, not based on funding based on this is what can really really work well for my families for your families for these kids for the community so informal collaborations that when there's 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 no no money at stake there's no funding at stake right so you do you share your the workshops we share calendars 
we'd send out monthly calendars. This is when this is on, this is when this is on. And then we also quite often, we would guest speak for each other. I would facilitate, I would give, I would give a workshop like this, Employment Connections would come and they would give a workshop to our kids, our high school students on employment and resume building. So we really would share our services and all again, informally, informally, no funding is based on it. It's really, that's the way that informal collaborations are going to work is if everyone kind of believes in it and, and you have to have a hook, you have to have a buy-in, right? So in order for us to get the Literacy Society and Success and Employment Connections to buy into what we're offering, it's like, this is what I can offer you if you can offer me, offer me that, right? Again, in smaller communities, it's quite often out of necessity. So one of the big things that we've done in our community, and we've done it for several years with our informal collaboration, is we have done a community settlement fair. And by settlement fair, it's kind of like a one-stop shopping. So this past year, Swiss spearheaded. Each year, we, we a, a different person in the collaboration spearheads it. So this year, we spearheaded it. Uh, it, 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 it was tricky. It was tricky with COVID. I have to say getting a bunch of people together and you have to have vaccine passports and all sorts of things. It took a lot of uh, communicating. It took a lot of organizing. And we did this with the city of Fort St. John was our, our biggest kind of partner in this. They, um, they gave us one of their uh, buildings to use. And so we invited service providers around the community to come and just be part of this drop-in open house. We took the lead on it this year. And by doing that, we were able to put our funding towards it and a little bit of somebody else's funding, a little bit of somebody else's funding. So we could cover insurance, we could cover um, the things that, that we needed to cover it for, the, for the costs. We had I don't know, something like, let's just say $200. That, could, that couldn't have covered an event. But if seven people put in $200, you can cover an event. Uh, the city of Fort St. John, we've been very fortunate that um, we've never had to get a hook or have a buy-in from them. They, they completely, completely um, believe in the program. They value the program. They value all, all the newcomers that are here. So, so they, they've been absolutely wonderful. Um, so we had all of the, the community service providers come, set up tables, do a drop-in, get information, kind of like a one-stop shopping. And so when I think on the next slide here, we have some pictures of what that kind of looked like. So that's in a nutshell what it looked like. We had the library set up. We had the uh, school district 60 set up. Where employment, uh, work BC employment services, that's always huge for our for our clients we see we see success there the literacy society the fort st john public library the city of fort st john they gave out bus passes they gave out bus routes there is a lot of information packed into this little drop in and again this was all organized with an informal collaboration um, when we each put in a little bit of money, we can do the best for our clients. And that's, that's kind of what, that's kind of what community's all about, right? So that's just one of the things that we've done in our community um, with, with these kind of collaborations. So another pro of collaboration is strength. So when you have the different people collaborating, then you get more creative and diverse input. Right, so it's not only your strengths work-wise, but it's a lot of diverse input, things that you wouldn't even think about, things that you wouldn't even know. You're, you can really tap into like a bigger group of strengths, like the combo of strengths, ideas, approaches to the projects, brainstorming, innovative results that really can raise the quality of the, of the project, right? So even the smallest things in our settlement fair that we had had was, 
where are we going to have a sign in table like and and so where we normally would have thought a sign in table would be somebody else that in, within our group said well what if we did it this way that way the flow goes there so, some things that you don't even think of right just right from the littlest details to the big things like well what if they trip over that cable what about insurance and the city pops up well i've got that covered oh well we had to do um what was it called like a kind of a site plan or a schematic i had no idea how to do a schematic i emailed the group does anybody have a clue one person popped up and said oh i had to do one last week for something else let me do that right so even though swiss took on the role of organizing it didn't all fall on the swiss people to do it so you you really one of the the pros is like big strengths that you get out of it and another one of the huge pros is morale right because when the weight's not all on your shoulders it's like when the weight is on your shoulders it, people become very um anxious there's a lot of anxiety but having organizations that collaborate can have a really positive effect on morale because you know that you have other people that together we can accomplish the goals and we can really celebrate things together individually within a group you can celebrate and then if there is something that goes wrong you also you know take the fail as a group as well right so keeping that morale up like that wasn't a fail you did a great job let's do it different this next time um when this happens when you have the morale around you it really can people can really start to see a more positive view of your own self and your job and your other team members and then really it builds a lot of trust as team members can continue to contribute to accomplishments it builds trust now that goes beyond the community right that 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 goes to to individuals as well so say you you feel you didn't do such a great job and four people that you don't really know that are on on your team but you don't really know that well they reach out to you and they say you did a great job you did a great job we'll just try this next time or here let me help you that really brings up morale of the team and also it has that really happy side effect for individual accomplishment one of our biggest community events is our Fort St. John World Fair. This started many years ago. Um, it actually started when we were working with the province and it was the Swiss Youth Leadership Year-End Project. So all year we worked with leadership, with young leaders, did a lot of leadership training. They would volunteer at the library. They would volunteer in different things all throughout the, the year. And they would have their one big project at the end of the year. And what the kids would do, and we're talking maybe from grade 10 to grade 12 up kids, they would try to bring all of community members together. It includes the municipality, the mayor, the RCMP, the entire community was invited to an outdoor world fair it was all free because all of the different community providers and collaboration they all put money in towards it this is a this is a very expensive thing the kids would write grant applications to oil companies subway would you know donate food burger king would donate food what we would do in the community is get all of the different cultures together and we would have um, the world fair would be we'd have an ethiopian booth we'd have an india booth we would have a japan booth we'd have a china booth and it was all our kids and their families really to just bring some awareness to the community about the real cultural diversity that we have right here at home it was kind of a travel the world in your own backyard and we all know that the root of you know fear is the unknown so often you would have community members students parent anybody really citizens that they would see somebody dressed a little bit different than them speaking a different language eating a different food you know 
they're, they're a little bit hesitant to approach them. Why? Because of fear of the unknown. So if we bring more cultural awareness to the community, all of a sudden that unknown is a little more known. So when you start to create awareness, then you can start to decrease the level of fear. So that's what the whole premise of the World Fair is. And we would do it every June. Mind you, the last two Junes, we haven't done it because of COVID. We're really hoping to do it this year, but we're not sure. Um, it, it's expected in the community now. And this is just a few little leadership kids that started it. Now it's become a massive community event. Anywhere from 600 to 900 people within three hours go through this event. It's all free. We collaborate with everyone. We collaborate with First Nations. We collaborate with the city. We collaborate with the schools, the oil companies. Any person you can think of in this community has been approached and we have yet to have people say no. It's really, really a huge collaboration. The biggest one you can get in a small town. Next slide. We got a few pictures of it, I think. So, <laughs> Slide number one, absolutely, it makes me laugh every time I see it. So what we do is we cook the day before with a, we, we open up the high school and we bring everybody in to do the cooking. And this little, this little fella here, his mom always makes him stir the onions. <laughs> and it just, it makes me laugh every time I see this picture, I have it up on my wall because he was just bawling, not because he was sad, but because he had to stir all of the onions. And, um, and there's his mom in the background in the second slide they they think it's hilarious they just they think it's the funnest thing um in the third slide we have gary oker was our chief of one of the the doig reserve at the time he came he's the one in the red handkerchief and then madhu is part of our east indian culture and he's he's a great friend of our program they both are gary and madhu are, are great friends they didn't know each other so when Gary showed up to the World Fair and Madhu was drumming, Gary's like, hey, wait a minute, let me show you how to drum. And Madhu said, oh, no, let me show you how to drum. They had the biggest drum off. It was absolutely fantastic. That wasn't planned. It wasn't organized. They just gravitated towards each other with music. And that's, that's the beauty of collaborations. You never know what's going to happen. Those two formed a Friday night drumming group that came out of the World Fair. I mean, how amazing is that? And then if you can see down that we have our Bangra dancers, they're always so happy to come. Um, we have the mayor standing with a lot, a lot of our, our dancers and then the RCMP and our World Fair Panda. I, everybody came. It's just, this is a prime example that it doesn't take a lot of funding to have a really, really great event because of collaboration. We, we couldn't have done it. We could not have done it without collaboration. We didn't do it before and we couldn't do it again without collaboration. So that was that's one of our, our great big things. So there we go. One, I think I have a couple more collaboration pros. I have one more collaboration pro on the next slide. One of the biggest pros of collaboration is trust. Right. So the benefits is encouragement is given. Encouragement is received. Sensitivity is promoted. Right. Often, if, if one or two people are sensitive in the group, it's like, oh, well, you know, just just leave them. Don't they're, they're sensitive. But in a in a collaboration, that's that's promoted. Right. We focus on others. We have different responsibilities towards other interpersonal responsibilities um perspective taking is promoted right going back to the um going back to the settlement fair when i said oh we're going to put the door here well from my perspective it would work better here absolutely who's got something to offer right communication collective decision making making and it all comes from a place of trust and and that's really trust is one of the biggest goals of society um in contrast, trust is almost absent when you have collaboration. So that's one of the biggest collaboration pros that I, I really want to instill in people that when you do collaboration, it promotes trust. And again, we have that happy side effect of within ourselves. We can, we can learn to trust 
you know, it's not all on me. I have to do everything myself. I have to do everything myself. You, when you have other people that you can trust. So that's, um, that's the last biggest collaboration pro that I have. Uh, and now we're going to get into a little bit of the um, collaboration cons. So <laughs> tension, right? So when you collaborate, it's not all sunshine and roses. Like I just went through 10 different things that are, you know, this is great. Collaboration's great. But with the good comes the not so good. So when you have a collaborated group, you sometimes end up with too many people trying to lead the group, right? So then you have the members that kind of sit back and they want to take a back seat and do just barely the minimum, right? So then that mindset seeps over a little bit to other areas of the work environment, causing a lot of tension. It can start out as a little bit of tension, a lot of tension among the rest of the staff, including those that might not even be involved in the collaborative effort, right? So maybe I'm collaborating with the library and one of the library staff's like, no, I'm just going to sit back and let you do all the work, right? So then, you know, it's like, that doesn't feel so great, right? So that's going to cause a little bit of tension. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk to my coworker and say, yeah, you know what's going on over there, right? So that's going to seep out into someplace else. So that's really... As much as collaboration is good, there are these little things that we really have to pay attention to. So when you get too many, too many people trying to lead the project, not enough people that are, that are willing to do the work, you can come up with some tension, right? Which will bring us to our next slide. Conflict. <laughs> there's always conflict. Where, where there's pros, there's cons. And where there's collaboration, there's, there's often conflict. So... We talk about getting um, different people together to collaborate on a project or a, a group of projects or a set of things. There could be conflicts with the working styles of individuals in the group. And I, I think we've all come across people in our work environment that have different working styles, right? her working style may be different from his working style. His working style may be different from my working, st working style. That can really, really hold up, really hold up a project. It can really hold up progress uh, because, you know, you're, you're trying to muddle through the conflict. And so that kind of takes away your attention on the task at hand. And it, um, it can ca cause a divisiveness. I mean, conflict is something that needs to be addressed right away or the tension and the conflict can really boil over. And a lot of it has to do with just, just basic different working styles. So in order for the collaboration to work, the conflict can't be there, right? So you had to really reduce that conflict by maybe adjusting your working style or being a little more open-minded to other people's working styles. Because if not, the conflict is, it, the conflict is real. It's there. L trust, right? So we talked about how great trust can be because you have these people that you know you can count on, right? It's not all on you. You know you've got a whole group of people you can count on. What if you have a group of people that you can't count on, right? So if you don't trust, if I don't trust that, you know, my, my coworker is gonna get their job done, um, if one person doesn't pull their weight and it's a collaborative effort, the person who misses the deadline or doesn't complete it, really can negatively impact the whole group. It leads to frustration. There's lack of trust within everybody. And for future, for future projects, you know, if, if you're not pulling your weight and people don't trust you, you're not going to be included back in for the next project, right? So there's a, there's a lot of um, as much trust as there can be. The lack of trust can be a big can be a big con, right? So then the effectiveness of the work and creating tensions in the workplace, that all is going to boil over into the, and, and it will lead to that conflict. So I see here, while lack of trust is one of the disadvantages of collaboration, a careful team management can, leader can help prevent it. So when team leaders set very, very clear expectations for their groups, outline 
specific expectations for each group member, including deadlines, you can use milestones to really keep each team member accountable. Um, when the team members are accountable for the portion of the work, the team can work productively and other team members can really gain that trust of sense in each other. So where there is a lack of trust, there's a lack of leadership. So when you have a, a careful team management leadership that can really, really curb the lack of trust. So although it's a con, it's a con that can be managed, right, by, by effective leadership. So that's kind of where I was going with that. What, we're going to get into a little bit of competition goals, the pros that can come out of competition, right? Because like I've, I've said several times here, where there's, there's the pros, there's the cons, right? And the cons of competition are one thing. The goals of, the pros of competition can be goals, right? So competition can really motivate employees, make them put more effort and achieve results, right? So if you've got a set goal and you set real, like pretty, pretty significant goals, it can help people work harder. A lot of people, they, they don't have the initiative. Employees don't have the initiative. So if a leader sets a goal and the employee hits that goal, it motivates them and then they'll feel super accomplished and satisfied, right? So having clear goals is a really good thing when it comes to competition. So another pro for competition, ideas. So healthy being the keyword healthy competition between teams can really produce some really cool ideas, right? So if you get two or three teams charged with doing the same thing, they know the other team exists, but they don't share resources because they're being competitive, right? So they're not sharing the resources, but they each want to come up with the best thing because they want to be the winner. That's, you're going to, you're going to get the best from each team, right? And so that kind of competition between teams can really create a, a real intense feeling for, for the, the results of the organization, right? So you have a couple of people, bring me your best, bring me your best. I just lost my earphone. Bring me your best, bring me your best. You're gonna get the best because everybody wants to, everybody wants to really win. That's kind of the whole point of competition. So I don't have a lot of pros for competition when it comes to work, but those, those are two of the, the pretty big ones. Uh, cons. <laughs> so when you're competitive and you've got a con, sharing. So competition starts showing up, people start hoarding systems, right? They start hoarding, you know, the resources and they start hoarding the staff. And it's like, well, you know, I, I say, oh, three teams are going to come up with their best ideas. Well, leader number one is going to go grab the best graphic designer, the best, you know, person to do all the different things. So then you start hoarding. So that's, that's one of the things about a con is you stop sharing everything. And in communities, and even within our settlement sector, say there's one funding pot available everybody's going to try to get that funding when you're competing for it. No one's going to share their resources. No one's going to tell you what their ideas are, right? So that's one of the things. It's you, you share nothing when you're competing and, and it's not, it's not healthy. It's not good for anyone. And, you know, in, in the case in our, our community here, we've had, we, we lost our lip contract in the community. Right. So when one organization does everything and they don't share, it can be devastating to an entire community if you lose that funding. So that's uh, that's just something to be super aware of when you're competing. You know, we, we've also had in our community, our, our CMS, CMIS group several years ago there was some funding from community way only one person could only one person could apply for it in the community and so the four of us sat down literacy society employment connections success and school district 60. we all sat down to get this funding was going to be great for everybody but only one person could get it so we all sat down we decided that 
success. And we decided that Literacy Society would be the best person to write up the proposal. We all had to trust that they would share if they got it, right? So we all put in our trust. We put in our ideas. They wrote up the big proposal and got they got the contract and everybody benefited from it because we just trusted that they were going to share it. Now, had they not shared their the, the contract, they would have gotten the funding, but they wouldn't have gotten the help from us, right? So that's be careful when when you're uh, when you're hoarding the, when you're hoarding things and not sharing. So that's another big disadvantage disadvantage of um, competition. Loss. That's exactly what I was just talking about. I kind of got ahead of myself. Uh, competing for funding projects, community um, organizations will underbid, and then they will underperform, and then nobody wins. Right. Communities can lose entire funding opportunities if one organization underperforms. And, and, and communities have seen it happen over and over and over again, because there's not that authenticity, right? So if, there's, if it's not authentic, then it's not going to work. And if it doesn't work, it's a loss for the entire community. It's a loss for the organizations. But more importantly, it's a loss for the, for the families that we service. So sometimes if you have an organization that's, that's a business and they're in it for the business and they underbid, they can underbid everybody. It, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not helpful for anyone. It's th this, this is a, that's, it's, it's a pretty big one. It's a pretty big one because it, it can be devastating. We live in a small community. We don't get a lot of funding. So when we do lose funding, it's big. Bigger communities, the bigger the community, the bigger the loss. Collaborative competition. Yay. So if you get a competitive team that knows to work collaboratively, collaboratively you'll get the best results. You, get, you have that leader, right? That one smart leader who can find ways to promote healthy competition within the team that can ensure the ideas are shared. So everything, the pros and cons that we just talked about, if you can kind of blend them together and ensure that it's shared, achievements are celebrated, losses are, you know, you lose together, you win together, you lose together, collaboration and competition have to coexist. Without one, the other is never sustainable, right? So collaborative competition is, it's, it's, you have to have, you have to have them both. You can't have one without the other. So that's um, a smart leader. That's, it, it just keeps going back to a smart leader, a healthy leader that's, um, that can promote this within a team, within a community is a Collaborative competition, remember that term. So in conclusion, I think everybody can kind of see where I'm going with this. What, and again, this is all just in my personal experience, in my work experience, in my life experience. Collaborative competition is the way to go because really, really great teams are made up of people who compete well. So you compete well, you have that competitive spirit in you, but you also respect other people. And you contribute equally. I mean, I have to give my my Swiss team here at school district school district sixty in city of Fort St. John. Our Swiss team is fantastic. We all have strengths, we all have weaknesses, but we really respect each other's points of views, and we all contribute equally. We have, you know, in any system, there's a hierarchy, there's a supervisor and a director and a worker and a this and a that and that. We don't think of it like that here. Everybody contributes equally based on their strengths, right? So understanding that to be good has to become a habit. It doesn't happen overnight. You can't just pick so, so, and so, and so. That's a great start, but you really have to practice it until it becomes second nature. I don't even, uh, to be honest with you, I, th the people on my team, I can't even tell you, I can't pick out one person who does one thing 
better than the other because it's all just second nature. And it just, when it works, it works. It runs like a, a like a really well-oiled machine. But I mean, we're talking 14, 15 years in the making. It's not going to take that long for people. But with us, it's just been over and over and over. We just practice it. It's habit. It's second nature. Um, it comes from everybody having a distinctive yet complementary role, right? So the best teams are the ones that have individual drive and understanding the importance and the power of the team. You can really, really, really benefit through cooperation and collaboration, right? You can super lose out through competition and distrust. So that is the end of my presentation. I really don't think that there's, uh, I don't think there's too much that I said that we don't already know. It's just really reinforcing what we already know and making it become habits. And when you see some of those cons starting to seep in, when you see that kind of come in, then, you know, just stop, step back, take a beat, figure out where that where the 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 chink in the armor is and try to straighten that out so great leaders great team members can really really benefit a team so thank you for listening thank you so much jane uh, i just want to read a comment to you in the chat i'm not sure if you were able to follow but when you were showing the pictures of the fair um alicia commented that this looks like so much fun uh, so thank oh. you <laughs> thank you for sharing uh if you have um, thank you if you have questions for Jane, uh, you can let us know in the chat or the Q&A, uh, and we will take them after we have our second presenter uh, present. Uh, so now I would like to introduce um, our second presenter, Steve Reynolds. He's an executive director at Regional Connections Immigrant Services, where he has worked in the settlement sector since 2007. He also serves on the board of Manitoba Association of Newcomer Service Serving Organization, MANSO, and is co-chair on the Pembina Valley Local Immigrant Partnership Regional Partnership Council. At Regional Connections, Steve supports a work of 85 dedicated staff working out of eight uh, out of four offices located in rural, rural Manitoba. Wrinkle more than Altona Dolphin with internet and remote services extending to the communities of Morin, Carmen, and Churchill. Together, the Regional Connection has helped welcome thousands of newcomers to rural Manitoba by providing settlement, employment, language, and community connection services with a unique focus on developing community and stakeholder partnerships. So welcome, Steve. I will let you uh, take over and introduce yourself. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm really happy to be with uh, all of you today. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm Steve Reynolds. I'm the Executive Director here at Regional Connections and Marine Services in rural Manitoba. And thanks to Sarah and the AMSA team for the opportunity to be with you today. It's an excellent and important topic, collaboration in the small center settlement context. And so really looking forward to uh, the discussion later and really uh, appreciated the comments and what we learned uh, so far. Um, I've been here, as Sarah mentioned, at Regional Connection since 2007 when I started as an instructor in our English at Work program, partnering with local employers to deliver on-site English classes for newcomers in the workplace. I've held a few different roles here at the organization and have been executive director for the last three and a half years. And for my presentation today, I'd like to share a bit about our organization, a bit about our organization's story and the communities we work in, and some of the immigration dynamics that we see that affect how we work and collaborate together. All of those are different pieces of collaboration, uh, both at the organizational and community and like service delivery levels. So we'll look at those things through uh, that lens. And I just wanted to acknowledge as well that where I'm located today is on Treaty 1 territory, which is the ancestral uh, lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. So at Regional Connections, we are a small center settlement service provider in rural Manitoba. 
Our vision is that we are building community together and our mission statement includes that we are providing coordinated services for our clients by collaborating with community partners and stakeholders. So collaboration and working together is right at the heart of our DNA and what we try to do and who we try to be uh, every day. We have four office locations, as mentioned, in Morden, Winkler, Altona, and Dauphin. Uh, we also provide regular in-person itinerant services to a couple more communities in Morris and Carmen. And just new since uh, the second half of last year, we've been providing remote services for newcomers arriving to Churchill, Manitoba. And I know small center or rural can mean very different things in different parts of the country. A uh, small center can be 300,000 people or 30,000 people or 300 people and everything in between. <laughs> uh, for us, each of the communities where we work in person is a hub for surrounding villages and rural area areas. But even these hub communities range in size from 900 people to 18,000 people. And within our service areas, newcomers have settled in all available contexts. There are people buying rural farms and acreages <clears throat> to building in subdivisions and developments uh, in the outlying areas of towns to settling in more central areas and apartments and condos. There's real diversity in how and where newcomers settle uh, in small centers. We've worked with just over 18,000 clients in the past 15 years. And one feature of immigration in our area is that retention has been good. It's really helped drive community growth. Some communities like Winkler have doubled in size in the past 20 years, with much of that growth coming through immigration. We've now worked with clients from over 130 countries speaking more than 35 first languages who call these communities home. So the communities we work in are primarily in three uh, different regions in Manitoba. They're not necessarily very close together. Um, Morden, Winkler, and Altona are in the Pemina Valley region, which is about 100 kilometers south, a little southwest of Winnipeg, right at the U.S. border. Uh, Dauphin is northwest of Winnipeg, about 300 kilometers. And Churchill, uh, as you probably know, is north on Hudson Bay. It's about 1,000 kilometers north of Winnipeg. So there's a map illustrating where everything is and uh, some of our staff from uh, our different locations there. And also highlighting within those communities, they're not only geographically diverse, uh, but the demographics and community makeup is very diverse as well. And that's important for collaboration and partnerships and what that looks like. For example, we work in and welcome newcomers to communities where less than 1% of the local population is Indigenous. And we also work in communities where over 20% of the population is Indigenous. We work in a community where 2% of the local economy is the manufacturing sector, and another one where over 25% is the manufacturing sector. So when we're talking about collaborating and partnering, I think it's extremely important to note that local newcomer demographics, community demographics, and community profiles can vary significantly from community to community. And one of the reasons we see collaboration is so important is that we know a cookie cutter approach to settlement services will not work well in these different communities. Our work needs to be informed by local needs and local opportunities, and those are different from town to town. I like to highlight how immigration trends contribute to those different needs and opportunities. The towns and rural communities uh, that we're in were largely established around 100 years ago here in rural Manitoba uh, when immigrants arrived to colonize the prairies and build some farms in some of these communities. A number of these communities were pretty status quo uh, from those initial waves of immigration up until the last 20 years. They'd been pretty stable uh, until and in terms of demographics and the people that were there, uh, the recent thing that really sort of changed uh, dynamics and demographics was the launch of the Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program in 1998. The MPNP has been very successful in creating a stream for newcomers to arrive to small centers around Manitoba, to job opportunities and communities that they may not have been aware of otherwise. And when MPNP started 24 years ago, one of the pilot sites was in Winkler, 
or 50 families from Germany were welcomed to help fill manufacturing jobs in town. Since that time, and due to the success, partly due to the success of that pilot, immigration has continued and municipalities, including the city of Morden and the town of Churchill, have partnered with MPNP to attract immigrants and fill labor market needs. Altona and the surrounding rural municipality of Rhineland are also one of the 11 pilot sites for IRCC's rural and northern immigration pilot. And newcomers have been arriving to Altona since September 2020 through that program. Importantly, these largely economic driven local immigration projects for us mean that over 80% of our clients are economic class immigrants compared to 60 to 65% nationally. That means partnering with employers and labor market stakeholders such as economic development offices and chambers of commerce has been especially important uh, in our situation. We've developed a one-stop shop service model at Regional Connections, and that means that settlement, employment, language, and community connections and support services are all available within each office with the fullest scope of services that we can put together available at each site. We really want to have a multi-site model and not necessarily hub and spoke as much as we're able to within our funding parameters. And we believe that collaboration starts at the funding proposal level. The proposal for the Rural and Northern Immigration Pilot in Altona was an excellent collaborative effort between multiple stakeholders, including regional connections, that I think contributed to the, to the success of that proposal. And we always look for a diverse range of resources to make sure that we can cover as many of the service gaps as possible that we've identified for our clients and in our community so that everyone is supported based on their needs and their goals and not only based on funder eligibility criteria. And that collaboration story for us too goes back a few years and is right within our organizational development story. That timeline that you see there with all those details illustrates that idea of collaboration starting right from that foundation of who we are as an organization. Our services and programs were initially very fragmented. We had three different contribution agreements that covered settlement language services uh, and literacy, and they were managed by three different people. They were housed in three different uh, locations in the same town, and they were housed under two different contribution agreement holders, a chamber of commerce and a regional economic development corporation. And those contribution agreement holders were a vital initial incubator and a strong supporter of our services. Well, at the same time as immigration continued and increased, we could see the need to pull things together for our clients. Firstly, it did not make sense to have our services scattered around town in various locations in such small communities. As I mentioned, program managers worked in three different physical locations. Classes and services were in half a dozen different places and high schools in the evening and church basements in the mornings. Clients would show up at one place and have to be redirected across town to a different one for the correct program. And we were aware working that we were working with the same clients, but we were duplicating some of the administrative work and some of the service delivery work. And we were creating access barriers for our clients, especially in communities with no public transportation, where quite a few newcomers may not have a driver's license or multiple vehicles after they first arrived. They may have a hard time getting around town, especially when it's minus 40 in the winter. So as a first step, we knew we had to at least get our services together in one place. So we did that in Winkler. We put a sign on a new building and the sign said <clears throat> regional connections. Internally, we still had separate programs operating under separate contribution agreement holders, but at least as a first step uh, at the physical level in person, we were in the same spot and clients could come to one place for settlement employment language supports, excuse me. <clears throat> Once we were co-located, the administrative inefficiency also became pretty apparent. A new client could have a settlement intake with the settlement worker, starting with all the basic personal information, and then be referred to the language program across the hall, where the client would sit down and give all the same information all over again. We knew the best way to create a seamless service experience for clients was to have staff who could really maximize the collaborative potential of working together across those different programs. And that was going to mean bringing everything together organizationally and administratively 
not just being in the same building together. So we incorporated Regional Connections as a nonprofit, and in 2016, we moved all those programs into Regional Connections Incorporated. It made a huge and tremendously positive difference to have everything housed together into a dedicated settlement organization that was focused on the needs of our clients. This has really allowed us to grow and develop. Since 2016, we've been able to add Swiss, Hippie, Tulip projects, additional employment supports, a fourth office, those remote services to Church Hill, and itinerant services to Carmen and Morris. I really believe that the working together, the idea of collaboration within the settlement sector really needs to start with our org structures. We need to do whatever we can to support our clients and help them reach their goals to successfully settle and integrate in Canada. I won't go over everything on this slide, just listed there is sort of a bit of a sample for you to see, but working in multiple communities, uh, there are a lot of different partnership opportunities. We have formal partnerships through memorandums of understanding that form, for example, the basis of the Swiss program, as well as plenty of working relationships with community level stakeholders and partners. These partnerships are critical for us and are really at the heart of collaboration. As I mentioned earlier, we don't want to set up a hub and spoke organizational culture. We do want to have our offices and services uh, be as full in scope and as local as possible at every location. Local staff who live in the community who can provide the best settlement and integration supports to clients who are also living in that community. However, where we have smaller communities that don't have the critical mass for a full scope of services being a part of the larger regional connections family means there can be remote or itinerant supports so newcomers have everything they need and so staff are part of a larger supportive team. As we focus on being a local presence while also tapping into the benefits of a well resourced larger organization. We spend a lot of time reaching out, meeting with, and inviting for inclusion local partners at all levels, from community volunteers to employers to other nonprofit programs and services to the municipalities and executive stakeholders. It really takes a whole community to welcome newcomers, and the ability to connect with all those stakeholders is a huge advantage of the small center context. A mayor, a CEO, a superintendent is just a phone call away and we can and should be working together for the best outcomes for newcomers. And I also need to mention as well as those local partnerships, the sector partnerships are critical for us in Manitoba. Uh, our umbrella organization is Manso and we work closely together across the sector and in particular also as Manitoba small centers, we connect regularly and have partnered on various programs and projects, network and communicate. I'd like to highlight just a little more specifically a couple examples of some of our collaborative programs or efforts that have worked out well. One is our English at Work program. It's an IRCC funded workplace language training program that provides on site English classes right in the workplace. We set up a formal agreement with local employers who provide the training room and the classroom resources. They cover 50% of the instructor's wages. We provide the instructor and the curriculum, cover the other 50% of the instructor costs. In most cases, the learners arrive towards the end of their shift. Part of the class is on company time, part on personal time. For example, a 90 minute class, the learners will arrive for, with 45 minutes left in their shift, being paid for half their class time and contributing the other half of class time with their own personal time. The program is flexible and has been successful for about 30 years in the region here. We normally partner with anywhere from three to four up to 10 to 12 employers, depending on recent immigration trends and hiring. Everyone contributes in this collaboration between us and the employer and the classroom uh, participants and everyone benefits. I still remember one year when I was teaching an English at work class wrapping up six months of twice per week classes at a local cabinet factory. We'd all had a good time together. I'd gotten to know the learners. They had gotten to know each other and me. I thought, I hoped everyone had learned some useful on the job English. Uh, but then one of the learners who was meaning to thank me said, Steve, this class was great. 
we can understand English here, we could talk to each other here, but when we go back out that door, we don't understand anything. And of course, that was a super deflating uh, comment to hear at the end of six months of training. The goal wasn't to create a small bubble for newcomers to enjoy in that training room. It was to help equip them for success in the workplace, in particular with their language skills. So we started making adjustments to the program and one key one that worked really well was hot seat guest speakers. So instead of just talking about different workplace issues and topics in the class, like health and safety, human resources, payroll, we started to invite guests from throughout the company to talk to the learners directly. The students would prepare for the visitor, whether a health and safety manager or an HR manager, a supervisor, et cetera, by preparing a set of questions, both personal and professional, that we'd work on together as a language activity, talk about culture and communication, and those kinds of things. I would forward those questions to the guest before they came to the class, and then they would come and visit they would answer questions from the learners. They'd be encouraged to bounce some of those questions back to create a real conversational atmosphere and exercise. Those visits often ran 45 to 60 minutes. Everybody enjoyed them and usually didn't want them to end. The feedback we got from the hot seat guest speakers was terrific. Executive, uh, executives, managers, supervisors would say things like, I didn't know those employees could speak so much English. And newcomer employees got to meet and become comfortable with key workplace contacts whom they would need to go to later with their questions and concerns and suggestions. So we didn't just talk about HR and health and safety and managers and management. We collaborated with them to create connections and to facilitate integration. So that's one example of collaboration that worked out well for everyone. Another example is in Dauphin. Dauphin and Region Immigrant Services started in 2013 under a Community Futures Office. Like we had experienced in the Pemina Valley, it became apparent that a valuable incubator model for starting services had matured to a point where Dauphin and Region Immigrant Services needed to take the next step. We spent the better part of a year meeting together as staff uh, with management and with boards between Regional Connections and those at Dauphin and Region Immigrant Services to propose a transition of services to Regional Connections for CFP 2020. And Dauphin and Region Immigrant Services uh, staff and the Community Futures Office were fantastic. We were all intent on putting the clients first and finding ways to support them best. So on April 1st, 2020, the Dauphin Settlement Services became a part of Regional Connections and a fourth Regional Connections site. And over the next 12 months that year, we we're able to increase the resources there from one and a half settlement positions to two and a half tap into Manitoba funding as well as IRCC to add a Swiss worker and a new LIP project, the Dauphin and Area Welcoming Communities Coalition. By bringing that local settlement and community expertise together with regional connections, larger organizational resources and dedicated mandate of serving newcomers, we're able to expand services and also relocate them from shared space and a church to a standalone 2000 square foot uh, office that was central and accessible uh, in the middle of town. It's still a priority to work as locally as possible in Dauphin, while also providing that additional support that may not otherwise have been available for staff and clients alike due to the lower client numbers in the community. This means local staff are working at the ground level and coordinating with community nonprofits, the city of Dauphin, the school division, the regional health authority, etc while we as an organization are also able to provide extra support, training and expertise for staff and program development. We're able to support clients through remote and online services like online English classes and remote CLB assessments, as well as information and orientation webinars on core settlement topics. We're still finding the balance in Dauphin and making sure the services and partnerships are as local as possible, while also tapping into that additional support of being part of a larger organization. Another simple but successful collaborative effort has been our newcomer welcome evening with the city of Morden. 
Well, it's been postponed during COVID. These monthly events regularly attracted 100 to 200 recently arrived newcomers and longer term community members. People would share food, meet new people and learn about the community. A different guest speaker would present on a local program or resource each time. But the real emphasis was giving community members a facilitated opportunity to welcome newcomers while providing recently arrived newcomers an opportunity to meet and get to know some of their new neighbors in the city of Morden. The city itself helped organize, run, and promote these events. They covered some of the costs. They partnered with us on all aspects uh, with our Morden settlement team. There are simple but effective ways to build community together, and we look forward to picking them up again uh, in the near future. And finally, a new collaboration uh, project, as I mentioned earlier, is a remote service agreement uh, with, sorry, it should say there, CCII, the Churchill Community Immigration Initiative. Churchill has started a new partnership with MPNP to attract newcomers to job opportunities in Churchill, a community of about 900 people in northern Manitoba. Churchill is also one of Manitoba's most northern communities and has no road access. But based on the success of our partnership in Dauphin and on this new COVID accelerated world where we can provide more remote and online support than ever before, we were confident we could provide remote support for core settlement services while partnering with the community so they could provide on the ground welcome and integration supports, including community tours and connections to local resources like the school, the rec department, library, community spaces and social connections. There's a lot of settlement and integration that we cannot do remotely. So that partnership and recognizing who would be able to do what was important to us. We created a mem uh, memorandum of understanding uh, with the Churchill Immigration Initiative, and we've been working with newcomers in Churchill now for the past few months. We have settlement staff in Dauphin who can provide settlement support online or by phone. Newcomers are invited to our webinars and online sessions, and we've had Churchill clients sign up for online English classes with us. Meanwhile, we're sure to make certain that the clients are well connected and referred back to local community supports for the kind of local in-person support and connections that we are not able to provide from a distance. So I mentioned we're just within the first year of this partnership together and we're interested in seeing how it develops over time. The Churchill Community Immigration Initiative and the people involved have been great to work with and we're looking forward to working together in the future. So that's a lot of different information on a couple different levels. Hopefully that's some, some of that is helpful or of interest to you. Uh, thanks again. I appreciate the invitation and look forward to some questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, so I will invite everybody now um, to post, uh, ask questions for both of our speakers. You can either use the Q&A box or you can also raise your hand. Uh, and uh, we will um, send you an invite to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question out loud. Um, I believe that we do have one question in the Q&A, and I know that, um, Jane, you already uh, answered, uh, but maybe, Steve, you can also give us your perspective as well. Um, so the question is, what would you say, would you say you have uh, less staff turnover compared to agencies in larger cities? Uh, I'm imagining that this could be a huge benefit to forming effective teams both within organizations and between them. That's a really good question. Uh, yes, hard to say. So a couple dynamics are things we've talked about. I mean, one is sometimes we're hiring staff for newcomers themselves, and this is their first Canadian work experience uh, working with us. And sometimes we see that we are a part of their settlement journey as they build their resume and their work experience and network and might be here for a year or two and then move on to something else that's more in line with their long-term goals or their profession. Uh, so in cases like that, we still see our relationship with those staff as a success, even if it's just employment for a year or two. Uh, but then others who are here for a long time, uh, yeah, for sure. I think uh, being part of the team is really important. And we've especially felt that and heard that from staff too during COVID, 
between those different programs and different sites, the ones that are closer together, normally we'd have some pretty regular in-person connections uh, just with staff, uh, summer picnics and holiday events and things like that, once a year program kickoffs, uh, most of which got suspended uh, or shifted to Zoom due to COVID and people really felt the loss of that. So yeah, the team and connection is really important and we've been trying to find other ways uh, through different employee engagement activity. We started a new committee, uh, employee engagement committee that staff led with five people and they've been really great at coming up with creative ways for staff to keep team building and connecting and feeling connected, even as like work from home and online work has increased. Um, so we definitely felt when some of that team and relationship was lost due to, to COVID and have been trying to respond to that. So it's important for people for sure. Thank you, Steve. Um, I do have some questions that we also received. Um, we had the registration form prior to the webinar. Um, so one question was, how can we all learn to be a little more progressive when it comes to decision making and collaboration? Okay. I can maybe speak to that a bit. <laughs> yes. Um, I think, uh, and I said, I said this a few times, it comes down to the leadership. Right. So if you have a, a leader who can who can identify the strengths and the you know maybe the the weaknesses of of different different players on the team then to be progressive the 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 leader you ha you have to have a strong leader to be progressive and uh and and really spearhead a leadership thing so so even if it's a collaboration you still need to have a, a strong strong leadership within a collaboration so i think that's a, that's a pretty key thing thank you jane steve do you have anything to add no, that's excellent. Yeah, I would agree. And and just establishing a culture even of getting out. We try to, you know, get out and not sit in an office as much as possible. So that also means like coordinating with community partners. Again, many things have been adapted the last two years, but normally to host and run services and activities in other places too, with the rec department or family resource center or library. So that even physically we'll be out, staff will be out, clients will be out and partnering and connecting to other places in town. And it's really important to have a culture where uh, we're not just in our office waiting for people to come through the door. Thank you. Um, another question that we received here um, is for someone who's just starting out, uh, where would you suggest that they look for potential partners? And what tips do you have um, for outreach to these partners? So I think um, it depends on what you're looking to partner for, right? So if it's a community event, so think of what 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 it is. Uh, for example, for our World Fair, we knew it was going to be a lot of food. It was going to be a lot of um, like food, dancing, culture, that kind of thing. So we we reached out. We needed a venue, right? So that that you just kind of start with the basics. So figuring out what you want to do. So if you need a venue, then okay find out where your venue would be. Ours happen to be a park. I go to the city for the park. You know, once you get the park, you need to have insurance. Then if it's a, if it involves, you know, food and dance, then, then you look through uh, with us, we would go with our students. We start, we would start internally and go from there. Right. So we're looking for the Phil, Phil can society, the, the Filipino group. So we have some Phil can society kids. You know, we talk to their parents. Then they're like, oh, well, I know so-and-so and I know so-and-so. And it just kind of blossoms from there. But if it, whatever your concept is, you figure out what your concept is and then you go from there, right? So if it's if it's all about, about arts and, and, and music, then maybe contact the arts festival. You contact. So that would be my advice when you're first starting out, depending on what your activity is, what your event is, what your program is, start with the very small things. We always start with the venue and then it goes from there and it grows from there. That's that's my little tip if you're just first starting out. I agree, that's great. And we'd also, we've noticed too in multiple communities, there's also like, it depends on the person you're potentially connecting with. It can change a lot. So we have, you know, a highly active partnership with the rec department coordinator in one town and like nothing happening in the next town even though we've tried 
because the person is responsive on the other end and interested in coordinating or collaborating or sensitive and aware to the needs of newcomers in the community and things like that. So partly too, we just pursue opportunities where the doors open up, where there's somebody who's like-minded and interested in working together, then awesome, let's work together. Other people will try to stay present and remind them that we're there, but uh, a lot can change. Sometimes a person changes in a position and the partnership totally changes because someone with a different mindset comes in for better or for worse. Thank you, Steve. Um, as a follow-up question to you specifically, uh, you mentioned um, the English at Work program. Um, so for somebody who would want to like start the similar program, like how do you go about that? Like how do you reach out to the employers? Do you have any tips for that? Yes, yeah. So the English at Work has been in Manitoba for quite a while. Like BC, our settlement services were under provincial administration up until 20. 13. Uh, and so it, it ran under the province of Manitoba for quite a while and has carried over under IRCC. Um, so for sure, I mean, there's a very first step of starting with the funder and it, it fits under workplace language training for us with our IRCC direct services. Um, but then employer outreach is also that kind of just kind of regular, there's the drip communication approach. We use Chamber of Commerce e-newsletters and physical mail outs. Uh, every summer, uh, about a dozen employers in a community, especially if they've had a lot of job openings or expanding or hiring newcomers, will kind of cold call and ask if we can stop by and introduce ourselves and a couple of different services that would be of interest or benefit for the employers. Employers definitely are operating with a very different mindset in the business world and they're looking for a return on investment and what we are offering to them and that kind of thing. Uh, so we try to make sure we bring that lens to those meetings, but also find in small communities here, there's a lot of entrepreneurship and local businesses and people are really excited and happy to talk about their business and what they do and show you what they do. And we kind of ask how we can help and how you know, a newcomer job applicant might be successful there and that kind of thing. Uh, so for sure, uh, showing interest in the workplace and the business that they do and uh, trying to think of what we can offer them as an organization is helpful. And then just that drip, regular communication. Things come and go, somebody hires uh, eight newcomers recently who have lower English skills and all of a sudden there's a need that they didn't have two months ago. And if we're kind of uh, present in their minds, then they reach out to us often at those times too. Um, another question that we got is uh, in terms of like, what kind of tips would you give for building that trust with partners? Tips for building trust. I mean, it, it is exactly what it sounds like. You have to build it, right? So it's not gonna come right away. So I, 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 you can start start off small. Right. So if you start off with just calling a meeting, showing up, doing what you say you're going to do, that's going to build the trust. So if you just have in, in, not you're not going right into a great big thing like World Fair, a great big thing like an English program. So you're just going to connect, make the connections. You reach out and do the phone call. Right. So that then they, they know you're genuinely, authentically interested. You show up at the small meetings. You, you, you start building the relationship. When you build the relationship, you build the trust, right? So it can be as easy as, hey, let's connect in my office. Let's connect at Tim Hortons. Let's, let's connect, right? So making the connections is, is going to really build the trust. Once you start building that foundation, then the trust will come because it, it won't come right away. You have to build the foundation first. So start really, really small and, and grow from there. That, that's my tip. Thank you, Jane. Steve, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, I don't think so. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, another question that we have um, received is in terms of how do you define success after you engage in collaboration? Uh, and how have you promoted that success after successful collaboration? Steve, do you want, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, for, for sure, um, it's always based on client needs, right? So we're trying to respond to needs that have been identified 
and how can we help them best and also just believing that one of the best ways to help them is by partnering and collaborating because for people to be connected and integrated to the community the more programs and resources the more social connections the more at home they feel all throughout the community uh, is better for our clients in the long term and for their long-term integration i actually have on my wall uh, here the ircc settlement project or program logic model which has been really helpful that shows how all the different uh, streams of direct service fit together and what the outcomes are and how some of the partnerships contribute to those longer term integration outcomes. So, I mean, in general, our longer term hope is that we sort of work ourselves out of a job as a settlement organization, that clients feel really welcomed here and, hopefully, and have great connections here and will be supported by staff, but eventually uh, they know people in town and places in town and are comfortable around town and have all the resources and skills and everything they need to keep moving along uh, towards their goals and to feel settled and at home and uh, don't need long term to keep coming back here. Clients are all different, of course, but that's uh, kind of the general goal uh, with partnering is that also we work ourselves out of a job eventually. I, I, um, I, I have to agree with Steve. It's really promoting, um, defining success is really, we're trying to promote um, independence, right? So once the, once the clients feel that, so they're not as dependent on you for services, they can, I can do this myself. With us, it's, it's the kids, right? So when they no longer need the as much support or any support, that's kind of how we define success when it comes to our kids, when it comes to our clients. Also with um, collaborations, knowing that a collaboration is successful is um, for us, it's, it's when people want more, right? So when you have an event or you have a class or you have an activity and people are asking you, when are you doing that again? When can I get more? That's that's for us a, a sign of a successful collaboration is repeat collaborations and when people want more. Thank you both. Um, another question that we uh, received is, um, so we've heard some of the challenges of smaller center service providers uh, is um, when it comes to finding time to collaborate as many hold multiple positions within the organization um, and have very limited time to engage in collaboration. Uh, what suggestions do you have for service uh, providers in smaller centers who might find difficult um, to find time to collaborate? I think, Steve, you might be um, a little more qualified to talk about this because with Swiss, we just kind of have our, we have our one program we don't have a whole bunch of, we do some collaborating with other programs, but because we're all in the same building and that you have a lot of different programs that I could see that it would be a challenge. Yeah, it has been a challenge and it's changed or evolved over time too, as you know, the communities have evolved and our organization has as well. So one of the ways that worked well that we started it out early on in some of those locations, like in uh, Altona and Morden started with one staff person uh, working out of a, in kind contribution office from the town or the city kind of thing but as soon as possible we did do like a division of duties basically where one person did office settlement support and another half-time position or next position did we call it integration work so then that other person was out in the community more and doing more of the relate relationship building and partnering and community connecting. And we found that work to make sure there is settlement service available in office all the time. So if clients ever showed up without an appointment uh, or just came to the door, there would be somebody there who could help them. They weren't out running around and doing stuff at the library or the park or whatever. Uh, but then as another staff person, even if it was only half time, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, had that integration focus. So that division of duties kind of worked well uh, early on that way. And then where that sits now, kind of as some things grew or there are additional programs, some of those are more with program managers more now. It's it's just sorted out in ways that make sense for the different programs. Thank you, Steve. Um, another question here um, that we received is in terms of how COVID-19 has impacted 
uh, collaboration in your community? I believe, Jane, you already mentioned that a little bit in your uh, presentation. As well. Yeah, it's um, we've had everyone, the whole world's had to pivot. <laughs> we, we've all had to pivot. Um, to be honest, one of the good things that came out of, of this pandemic is everybody had to kind of slow their roll a little bit. So there wasn't the running around from place to place to place because you couldn't, right? So we all got familiar with Microsoft Teams. We all got familiar with Zoom. We didn't have that before. So we could do um, a lot more connecting because it's it's uh, like Steve was saying, it's really difficult to get five or six different people together. I've got this meeting to go to. I've got that meeting to go to. Well, if you're not running around and you've got 20 minutes, we can all get together on Zoom. So that's kind of one of the good things that that uh, we've seen come out of COVID. On the other hand, you get that Zoom burnout real fast. Um, so it's been, we, everyone's everyone's had to pivot. All of our Swiss, and settlement services are based on trust and relationship building. And you do that through activities. You do that by showing up. When there's nothing to show up to, it's it's really difficult, right? We found a lot of our clients are like, we're super isolated. We were on the phone. We were needs assessments on the phone. We were delivering food. We were doing what we could when we could. Um, but yes, it's 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 been difficult when the whole premise of these settlement programs to settle people in the community to provide, you know, language services to provide employment services to provide any kind of services, you can't provide it because you can't meet face to face. So it was super difficult. We did, you know, online forms. We had like all all sorts of things, but it really came down to phone calls with clients and a lot of Zoom and Microsoft Teams with um, collaborating with the community service providers. So, I mean, some little bit of good came out of it because people actually did have the time to connect through Zoom. That way you didn't have to, because, and same, Steve was talking about, like when you, when you have a hub and spoke model, when you have to drive an hour to a meeting, you know, you, it, people, people often can't do that. When you connect through here, you're able to that's what we found as well i mean it wasn't without its challenges but um it 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 helped a little bit when you're in a a rural community and you're so, you have a vast majority of of geographical land to cover somebody can't drive in in two hours for a 20 minute meeting but you can on this yeah we experienced very similar things and a lot of that was one of the first things to be cut out or to not happen uh some of the the uh, partnership activities are Swiss team, for example, in one town had a whole after school drop in program plan with a family resource center uh, as soon as COVID hit and that was going to be new and that all got scrapped. And the health orders changed so quickly and with those different partners, they affected different partners differently at different times, a rec department or a school or a library uh, all had different orders applied to them at different times. So it made usually you're planning like for the whole year for, you know, a program through the winter or something like that, or a big multicultural event in the summer or something like that. And uh, that was pretty well impossible to do. So trying to keep the staff relationships up, as Jane was mentioning, and the calls. And for sure, that's one of the advantages of Zoom and online is pulling people in from across a broad geographic region. That's been good, but we've noticed as well as the advantages of online services and remote services and webinars, uh, the gaps and things that leaves out and especially for clients and newcomers, that relationship building component of even like an evening information session or something like that, where they'd be able to meet some people before, sit beside somebody they don't know and talk to them, chat with the staff after, uh, a lot of that relationship building stuff. You can, you try to incorporate it into a Zoom session or something, but it's just not the same. And so everybody has missed that for sure. Yeah, and, and just to, to speak on that, we we had um, our our youth group at the high school, they, they met regularly. It was a safe place for them to go in schools. You know, a, a lot of the safe places were taken away. And so that, that was really tough. Our, we, we have a fantastic Swiss worker uh, at the high school, Jen. What she was doing is she would try to do 
um, Zoom call so they would have a safe place to, you know, if they wanted to come and they wanted to talk. Uh, quite often we got asked, do I have to? They're Zoomed out. You know, they're doing school on Zoom. They're doing connecting on Zoom. Anytime that we would try to do anything extracurricular, students or um, or families are like, do we have to? That's that's kind of heartbreaking. Thank you, uh, Jane and Steve. Um, another question here um, that kind of connects to the to this discussion on the impact of COVID um, is: What kind of suggestions do you have for continued collaboration uh, in a hybrid model of service? Well, with us, because our focus is on school, that's really all I can really really talk about. And Steve has a, a, a bigger, a, a more more vast. Um, services that he covers but for us it's uh the hybrid model you know it, it works for some it, it doesn't work for others um the fact that we we don't really have any control over that right so uh, we can't say if you're going to be able to do your classes online or not online like we as swiss can't we just kind of have to roll with what the uh, health organizations say and what the school districts say um it's it's really tough although we had some kids that absolutely thrived working from home and other you know they, they didn't want to go to school anyway they thrived from working from home and then we had other ones that like school was the place that they went that was that was where they went that was where their sanity was so um it's kind of right now it's a bit of a hybrid and we're trying to figure out the strengths of of the kids that that like to be at school and the strengths of, of the kids that like to work from home and try to blend those together to to try to really um and capture everybody and that's when our swiss workers come in um knowing these kids knowing these parents and really a lot of communication is it still working for you are you still okay at home? Do you want to come back to school? Are you still okay at your job? Do you need more language classes? So it's it's the key is communication without overwhelming them too, right? So if you if you're calling and and a parent finally says buzz off, stop calling me. Okay, we're gonna buzz off and stop calling them. But um, really just keeping the lines of communication open and saying we're here. If something's not working from you, we can try to shift with you. Yeah, similar and there's. I think there's a lot of potential. We're, we're chipping away at it a little bit and want to continue to, because uh, as we mentioned earlier, just shifting entirely to online definitely leaves some gaps that are very important in terms of personal connections and building trust and relationships and networks and things like that, uh, really important. But at the same time, online uh, activities can create access also in rural communities where transportation's an issue, childcare in the evenings might be an issue. Uh, people can't always get out to things in person. And so a hybrid is a good potential solution for some of those clients. We've run it a little bit, just even in the last few months with a couple classes and a couple different things. And one of the things you notice right away though, is the additional like staff and administrative support that's needed to make that work. You can't just have one person presenting to a group or teaching a class or whatever. Now you also need admin support for the laptop and the internet connection and the, however you're connecting the hybrid services. So there's there are extra resources and extra staffing needed and we're still trying to catch up with that. We're still winging it all the time uh, with all the IT and tech and administrative support. There's a lot more of it required for online and hybrid services. Thank you, Steve. And I can see Jane nodding and agreeing <laughs> with what you're saying. Um, I do have a couple more questions here. Um, so this is more specific for you, Jane. You mentioned um, like the concept of um, collaborative competition. So do you, you have any tips or ideas for promoting healthy competition in collaborative competition? I think just start, like, collaborative competition is it's 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 a good and healthy way to motivate people right again with the starting small and starting fun right so don't make it too serious don't make the stakes too high starting with fun small little things so you really can team build right so even just little icebreakers little 
um, scavenger hunts that there's the stakes aren't too big to start with. So scavenger hunts or word searches and stuff like that to promote the team building. So, you know, I've got six people on my team, so we're going to break up into pairs and who can find these words the fastest, right? So just small little things that the, the stakes aren't too high, right? So then you start building that, you start building that, and then it becomes kind of a healthy habit. So promoting really healthy habits is, uh, is important and start small, start really small. Thank you, Jane. Um, one more question here is, um, in general, what would help smaller centers engage in collaboration more frequently and more effectively? What recommendations would you have? Um, so with us, because we, we are very small and we, we use our personal connections a lot. So, so, so that's a big thing, right? So if you know somebody at City Hall, contact City Hall, contact that person, even if they're in engineering, contact that person. So that's the beauty of the smaller centers is you usually know someone who knows someone who knows someone. So use your connection. That's a really good tip is to use your connections in smaller centers to find the people. So the, my friend in engineering may not know anything about recreation, but they've got a friend in the rec department they can connect you with, right? Or my friend at the library doesn't do children's readings, but her coworker is the children's librarian. So, so that's how I would, um, that's kind of a, a fun little, a fun little tip. You kind of use your connections, but Steve, you have probably have yeah. way bigger. No, no, that's very true. It's a huge advantage in small centers that are very relational. Uh, the only thing I would add is like just planning ahead and either scheduling or blocking off the time to do it if it's not part of the current routine. Otherwise, you know, everybody's day and week fills up with what walks through the door and what's going on right now. <laughs> so you have no time really easily. Uh, and so sometimes it's just planning ahead, whether setting those appointments with people for a few weeks from now, while there's still lots of room in your calendar and making sure it happens or just blocking the time off and uh, planning to give a couple people a call if it's not uh, appointment type relationships, but just making sure those spaces are carved out in your calendar so that they happen is really important. Thank you, Jane and Steve. Um, so I would like to uh, invite the audience. Um, if you have any questions, raise your hand, or if you would like to also share like an example from of collaboration uh, in your community, uh, feel free to raise your hand or let us know in the chat. Um, and we will invite you to unmute yourself and share as well. We would like to hear from others as well. I'd love to hear what other people are doing in their community. Like Steve and I shared kind of what we were doing, um, which is it, it, they're very similar. And I think everybody else will be similar. So, I mean, I would, I would love to hear what other people are doing or even what people are thinking of doing. Right. Cause that's right now we're collaborating. Surprise. We're collaborating <laughs> and it's healthy. So that'd be great. Let's see if we have any volunteers. <laughs> You can also, um, if you don't want to um, raise your hand here, you can also send send me by email um, your comments, um, and I can share it with the speakers after the webinar as well. Yeah. So if we don't have any um, comments, questions, I will give uh, Jane and Steve a uh, final chance to give any concluding remarks, uh, anything they would like to share, and then we are going to go into closing remarks. Yeah, I'd just like to thank you, Sarah, again, for the invitation and AMSA for supporting the event and everybody for participating. And Jane, it was excellent to hear from and, and learn from, and so really appreciate it. And, uh, uh, really good questions. So thank you very much and hope the rest of your day is really good. And I echo what Steve just said. It was uh, it was nice to hear from Steve. It was nice to see you, Sarah, and, and really share what we have. Sharing best practices is, you know, the best way that we can learn. 
And uh, if anybody has anything else they want to they want to hear from us, just let Sarah know. And I'm happy to receive any emails. I'm sure Steve is. I'm just talking for Steve. Steve's happy to receive any of your questions. <laughs> If you have questions, direct them to Steve. No, but it, seriously, if if uh, if you have any questions or you think about it later, it'll take a bit to digest everything. And you, you could be thinking, oh, I forgot to ask this. Then yeah, shoot us an email. We're 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 quite happy to answer your emails. Thank you for inviting us, Sarah. We're always happy to um, to share our best practices. And thank you everybody for your time for coming today. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining uh, today's webinar. We would like to thank our speakers, uh, as well as the interpreters, chatbox translators, for their time and effort. Before you go, if you would like to stay connected with uh, the settlement integration sector, sign up for our weekly newsletter, Settlement Net. Uh, once the recording from this webinar is made available, you'll be notified via Settlement Net. Also, a way to stay connected, uh, you can follow us on social media. Uh, AMSA can be found on Twitter at AMSA BC and on Facebook and LinkedIn as AMSA BC. And lastly, uh, we will be sending out a evaluation form following this webinar. Uh, please take a few minutes to complete it as we rely on your feedback. And thank you, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your day.